Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's show. And if you are joining for the first time, this is part of our product showcase series in which we invite the enterprise software vendors. And for today, we have a very exciting solution. Uh, it's uh, Apicor Advanced MES. Uh, Apicor has many different products. And today, we are going to be discussing the MES. The intent and goal of this series is really to discuss the market positioning of these products, the capabilities, as well as what they might be working on in the previous quarter, um, as well as the future quarters. Uh, we have had uh, a couple of different vendors. We have reviewed Sage Intact. Uh, we have reviewed Kibo. So uh, more exciting vendors are going to be lining up for this series. So I'm super excited to bring Apicor here. Before we dive into the solution, we are going to start with everybody's intros. If you don't know me, I'm your host, Sam Gupta, principal at Elevate IQ. Elevate IQ is the independent ERP and digital transformation consulting firm. On that note, I am going to move to Jeff for his intro. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Jeff Overwine. Uh, I'm a solutions engineer for Epicor. I've been in this, in this industry for over 30 years. I've been uh, back with Epicor now for about eight years. My primary focus is to do pre-sales uh, for uh, our prospects uh, within the Epicor suite of products. And my focus is really around IoT Industry 4.0 products uh, within, uh, within the solution. And typically, uh, my role is to help them understand what the product's functionality features consist of, uh, see if there's a fit, and then finally um, consider the demo guy. Okay, amazing. And we are going to have an exciting demo today. Thank you so much for being here, Jeff. Andrew, can I ask you to introduce yourself next? Yeah, for sure. Hey, Sam, how are you? My name's Andrew Robling. I'm a principal product marketing manager at Epicor. And kind of like Jeff, I've been around a while. I've, I've been working in the manufacturing software industry since 1998. So uh, this will be my 25th year coming up in that industry. And I, I worked a lot with automotive manufacturing companies. In, in fact, when I was making my way through college, I worked in a in a plastics injection molding plant that made dashboards for for cars. And uh, my present role today, I'm 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 responsible for uh, the smart factory industry 4.0 from a product marketing uh, perspective at Epicor Software Solutions, primarily on the manufacturing side. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much for being here, Andrew. And uh, if you are in the audience and joining for the first time, make sure you guys post your questions and comments. Our goal is going to be to cover your questions first before uh, you know we talk about our own agenda. Uh, so uh, the first question that I'm going to post for the audience, number one, uh, post where you are joining from. And number two question is going to be, what comes to your mind when you think of MES? Whatever it is, just post uh, whatever comes to your mind. On that note, Jeff uh, and Andrew, I am going to kick off the conversation in setting the stage overall from the perspective of, I mean, you know, I don't know whether you guys are familiar with the Industry 4.0 community. Uh, there are a lot of people hanging out on the Discord, Slack. Uh, you know, there's a very involved community in general. And... One of the most heated debate always is going to be about IT versus OT. And when you talk about ERP versus MES, I think it falls under that IT versus OT debate. So we are going to talk about you know, the strategy that you guys are taking overall from the MES perspective, because there are going to be a lot of considerations that you need to take when you talk about the operational technology, the operational technology that is going to be integrating with the machines overall. So in your experience, when you look at the overall architecture of, let's say, ERP versus MES, how do you sort of think and how do you recommend that to your customers, Jeff, uh, if you want to start um, with your commentary? Yeah, if you look at MES, it's very specific to, uh, you know, focus around the shop floor itself. So it's not just data collection in real time from your different equipment on the shop floor. It's embedding scheduling functionality uh, to, to visualize, you know, uh, is the demand um, going to be completed on time, for example. It's also um, analytics, understanding past performance. Um, 
it's it's preventative maintenance, AI, it's quality. So when you talk about manufacturing execution systems, its focus is really on the shop floor to really provide analytics around performance, help them understand those uh, trends and analysis, uh, and then provide that visibility. When you talk about ERP, it encapsulates you know the entire business structure from what we call quote the cash. So it deals with finance. It deals with uh, shipping and receiving. It deals with you know uh, uh, material inventory and a lot of other elements. And and our focus with MES is really on the shop floor. Okay, amazing insights there, Andrew. Do you have anything to add there by any chance? Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe the only thing to add is, you know, when you look at ERP solutions, they typically have some way for customers to do some kind of production reporting within them, right? So they, they it may be manual. Some of them might have some simple kind of integration to machines where they're capturing some simple cycles, et cetera. But when we're talking about MES, it really does expand the umbrella when you look at that, that definition of MES. It goes beyond just connecting to machines and gathering signals. We're talking about uh, you know, process control, potentially statistical process control, capturing temperatures, pressures. As Jeff alluded to, when you look at an ERP solution, typically the scheduling, when you're talking about production scheduling, it's it's based on a standard, right? You, you've yep. got some kind of standard cycle time, right? Sam, you would probably be familiar with that, right? You're, you're yep. producing to, hey, it's 60 pieces an hour is kind of what you've got things set up as. Well, when manufacturing starts, you pretty much can throw that standard out the window a lot of times, right? All kinds of things happen. Maybe the the, the cycle time is going to be slower than expected, faster than expected. You're going to scrap more parts than you thought you were going to have more downtime, right? So so things like the real-time scheduling element within an advanced MES solution can be really important to, to making sure that you get your parts uh, out on time and meet your customers' demands out there. Okay, very good insights. Thank you so much, guys, uh, for those. So the next layer that I am going to bring in in terms of the confusion that I often hear in the community overall from the network architecture perspective, okay? So when I say network architecture, typically when you look at the MES, they are going to be integrating with the machines, right? And traditionally, if you look at the overarching architecture of manufacturers, I mean, this is the personal story. I mean, when I walk into any of the manufacturing facilities, the president is saying, you know what, you IT guys, you don't touch my machines, okay? I don't want anybody to be touching these machines. So that's a feeling that they typically have overall from the MES perspective, because there is a fear overall from the cybersecurity perspective, if you really think about it, because now if your machines are going to be controlled by your software, that's uh, you know, it, it's slightly frightening for the customers who might not be as comfortable in bringing these machines online in general. So one of the things that they talk about in the community is going to be, okay, how can we separate these network? So your OT network is going to be very different from your ERP network. Now, I don't know whether this is going to be a cloud solution that you guys, uh, you know, position to your customers. Uh, you know, do you guys typically keep the network separate? Are they part of the same network? Are they part of cloud? Do you want to touch a little bit more from the infrastructure perspective? Jeff, Andrew? Go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, you hit on a whole bunch of things there, Sam. So I think a lot of stuff's really interesting. And I think typically when you're looking at an MES solution, uh, it's probably going to be some kind of hybrid you know, solution at best, right? Where there's some components that are on premise, some components in the cloud. So, you know, as an example, when you're looking at an MES solution, you, you, you might have uh, an edge computing component to it, right? Where, where you've got a device that's talking to the machine yeah. and uh, potentially telling it to do something under certain circumstances. So, you know, as an example, we've got a, we've got a customer uh, down in Kentucky that makes, uh, makes batteries. And one of the things they do is when that battery is completed, the production of that is completed there, we're measuring process um, parameters around that temperatures, pressures, you know, those kinds of things about that battery. And if it falls outside of certain parameters, we're going to trigger the maybe the conveyor to open up a gate and, and eject that part. Simple kind of edge type of thing, but really powerful, right? Because we don't want that battery to make it farther down and have more, uh, you know, labor go on to it when it's potentially a bad part, right? We can immediately eject it. So there's definitely going to be that edge component that'll always be on site uh, down there. Um, we also see that happen a lot uh, in international installs, right? So sometimes you might have 
an install maybe headquartered here in North America, and maybe they've got a plant somewhere in the developing world, and their uh, infrastructure is just not as good there, right? So the network goes down all the time, maybe, you know? Uh, so in that kind of circumstance, it pays to have that edge computing device. If the network goes down, in our case, it continues to capture the cycles, the information from that machine, all the production information. And when the network back up to the cloud, you know, ERP instance, for example, is reestablished, then it can then pass that uh, information back up into the cloud. So there's definitely a lot of considerations from a network standpoint and, you know, the, how that plant performs and the, you know, what, what's going on, what part of the world it, it's in when we're, when we're looking at uh, a developing uh, the infrastructure. So Jeff, I think, is sharing an architecture screen here. This is just a simple architecture screen. It's actually really what he's showing primarily is a kind of an on-premise install of, of advanced MES. And you can see that um, we can connect to machines different ways. So, we, you know, through OP, OPC, open platform communication, could be empty connect. Uh, we could just get an analog or digital signal directly from a machine as well. And I'll add to that. So um, you yeah. got to remember with advanced MES, what we're doing is we're providing you real time visualization on what's actually happening on the floor. So essentially what that's meaning is, is we're pinging every piece of equipment every second of the day, every minute of the of the hour, every hour of the day. And we're, pr we're providing a visualization that says, here's what's happening on my floor. Am I in a run state? Am I down state? Why am I down? How long have I been down? And there's a lot of different ways we do that. And, and this diagram kind of helps us understand the different ways. And we, we have newer technology that allows us to pull that in through an ethernet port on a machine and, uh, and, and pull that data into our database. And we also talk to, you know, we have customers that have machines that were built in the 40s and the 50s, and and it's old relay logic type machines. Um, and it, it allows us to pull that information from older equipment as well. But what we're doing is, is we're using a pathway to pull that into our database, and then our, our software allows us to visualize performance on the shop floor. That's just one aspect of the, of the MES solution that we provide okay great points guys um so the next segment that i would like to cover is going to be overall architecture and i know each business is going to do things differently depending upon their probably business outcome uh but for the most part there are going to be major component in my mind whenever i'm looking at any whether it is erp mes whatever it may be right for me what is more important is the architecture and the data flow the way your transactions are going to work the way your processes are going to work so a couple of things that are always very sensitive because when we get into this whole it and ot debate i mean you know everybody's sort of pulling the architecture in their direction you know everybody's thinking that hey scheduling is my job okay i'm supposed to be doing scheduling <laughs> you know quality is my job so overall in terms of let's say if you were to sort of picture the architecture and you were to provide the ideal picture for the manufacturers where should they be hosting the scheduling preventive maintenance and quality because erp is going to have some functionality mes is going to have some functionality so guys can you provide clarity in terms of where they should be hosting these three processes yeah i can answer some of that so you know in the software um you know we have all elements of that and and sometimes you'll find that erp has that and with epicor advanced mes you know it could run completely standalone and it could be uh you know we could get demand in the form of here's what needs to run from an excel spreadsheet you know but we could also get that from other erp systems uh, so it's not just an, an embedded integration to Epicor ERP, but we know that exists, and there are there are there are benefits and, and value behind that. But with scheduling, you know what happens is, you know, you need a finite piece of software that says, here's when this job should be due. But the reality is, we know that there are nuances that happen on the floor. You know, I predict that when this job is run in the past, you know, that, you know, predictability says I can I can tell you that we're probably going to have two, three hours of downtime. I can say that uh, in the past, 
uh, we typically produce product at this rate. Um, and then there's other things that happen. In molding, for example, you might have block cavitation. So you have a four cavity mold, you block two off, you're already running a 50% capacity. So all these things that happen day in and day out on the shop floor, ERP doesn't understand the performance level. With advanced MES, because we're connected you know, to your equipment, we understand the element of downtime. We understand that I should be producing a part every minute. The reality, it's taken me a minute and a half. I got to produce, you know, 2,000 parts. That extra 30 seconds in a cycle or five seconds or two seconds, it matters. So from a performance perspective, you know, scrap, what we call overall equipment effectiveness or OEE, those assets or those values come into play. And what we do in our schedule board is we reflect that. So there's elements of scheduling that exist in ERP. There's elements that we enhance with advanced MES that uh, uh, that can include things around scheduling. Uh, but the same concept would apply to preventative maintenance uh, quality. And I'll kind of give you an example of a couple. Preventative maintenance. I can say that, hey, I want to perform this activity, and maybe it's on calendar day. The reality is, though, you know, I want to understand a much more efficient method of doing maintenance on a tool or a machine resource. And maybe that's by run hours or how many cycles or hits a die occurs. Well, with our real time application, it allows us to provide visibility into those increments outside of just calendars, calendar days. So, for example, I might have, you know, two different tools. We prefer one tool to be used on a stamping machine and the other tool, you know, if I'm doing PMs on calendar basis and I say every 60 days, well, the other tool is primarily sitting on a shelf. Do I really need to do that every 60 days? So if I can say, hey, I want to do this every 5,000 hits, now that tool that sits on a shelf might only, you know, take, uh, you know, uh, 2,000 hits within 60 days where the other tool might have six, 7,000 hits within 60 days. So it, it provides a different um, visibility with real-time analysis to all these different elements that you could compare what ERP and MES could do. Okay, amazing. And do you, anything to add there, by chance? Yeah, sure. Just just a little bit. So there, I mean, there's a few things you talked about. So scheduling, you know, think think of in the ERP solution. Typically, if someone, you know, all the schedule kind of really needs to take place there to begin with, right? Because that's that's got all the sources of demand in it, et cetera, right? So the the schedule comes from there. It's it's typically a window of a schedule, though, right? If I'm a scheduler, I'm creating that schedule, you know, probably for like a once a week and maybe making some minor changes to it as the week goes on as a scheduler, right? At best, I'm doing it once a day. Um, so that schedule's static, and then that can get transferred to the uh, MES solution, and now I can see kind of the, like, like Jeff had mentioned, the real-time impact on that schedule based on what's actually happening on the floor. And then it's up to you whether that's a two-way street. If you want us to go back and update the schedule in the ERP, Great, we can do that. Maybe, but maybe, maybe you don't want to do that. That's kind of your static schedule on there, and 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 you know the guys on the shop floor are going to be viewing the schedule in the uh, uh, in the advanced MES solution in that particular case. And same kind of thing when you're talking about quality, we can get a lot more granular, right? So we talked about some things you, you'd mentioned. Yeah, ERP solutions typically have some kind of quality component within them. You know, I need to do, and it's, usually it's more inspection related kind of quality parameters, right? You know, after I make 5,000 parts, I need to do an inspection. Or uh, every time I run this particular part, I need to do a, you know inspection at the beginning of it and, and, and every so often, for example. Where um, the MES kind of comes in is when I want to do things like statistical quality control or statistical process control, right? So now yep. I'm, 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 if, if there's measures, like I gotta, I've got to do some kind of a measurement, we can measure that real time and confirm that it meets the parameters and you know things can continue on or that part could get scrapped instantly. We can look at uh, process parameters to determine if it's a good or a bad part, right? If if the temperature exceeds a certain threshold, then that's that's a scrap part and we can you know immediately scrap it. So I think we we really enhance the the quality capabilities. Of course, all of this right information you're gonna want to have where possible feed it back into the ERP solution. 
may not always be possible, right? So an ERP yeah. solution maybe doesn't have a spot to put temperature and pressure information or whatever you're capturing, right? But it probably has a spot to track uh, scrap, you know, so, so that kind of information maybe flows back to it. And I think Jeff did a great job talking about preventative maintenance. That's another really great area where I run into and they, they start realizing, whoa, I can actually do my maintenance based on, uh, you know, the number of cycles the machine is is making, for example, or the number of setups, you know, all those kinds of things can now get, come into play from a maintenance standpoint, where usually in an ERP solution, it's less specific, right? It's like, like Jeff had mentioned, it's usually, hey, I can, I can trigger maintenance once a week, or once a month, I need to do this maintenance procedure. But you know, you're not looking at the usage of the asset, anything like that. It's just kind of a a, a time frequency based uh, uh, trigger, right? Which you may not have used that asset at all. You may have used it a lot more than you expected, right? So so the where is going to uh, correspond, and when you need to do that maintenance procedure is going to, you know, come into play. It's like like you know, you and I, Sam. I I, I I've got a I've got a Honda Civic that I drive around in, right? I don't know I don't know what you drive out <laughs> out, out there today. Do you have, do you have a car, Sam? Yeah, I do. I do. Uh, we have uh, a lot of them actually in the family. So we have um, a Nissan Rogue. Then we have, okay. uh, yep. you know, a lot of SUVs, I guess. Uh, you yep. know, um, yep. smaller cars don't fit our family anymore. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, then, right? You're usually you're doing maintenance on that car, right? And and you're not saying, you know, I need to do maintenance once every three months, right? You're 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 basing the maintenance you need to do based on the the mileage typically on your car, right? The so think of that as the cycles that the car has gone through, really, right? And then that can that can get triggered in an advanced MES solution, or or even better if you've got something that you know we can take it to the next level where your your uh, nowadays cars kind of are. Uh, measuring the oil um, quality of your car, right? And then kind of triggering when, uh, you know, maintenance maybe needs to happen, right? So that's kind of taking it to the next level where we're trying to uh, maybe not predict what's happening from a maintenance standpoint, but we're measuring it based on, you know, uh, set values that are happening out at that machine at any given moment. So same thing in the MES world, it could be based on, hey, if the vibration level reaches this amount, right, on that machine, then we know we got to take it down for maintenance before the, the the tool breaks, for example. Yeah. Yeah, great points, guys. So I just have one clarifying question there, Jeff, on your commentary when you mentioned the demand for your MES. Uh, could you touch a little bit on the data points that are going to be required? So are these going to be job orders that we are sort of feeding the MES uh, for it to form the demand, uh, you know, and then I, I guess, you know, it's actually going to drive everything else from that input, right? So, so what is that demand? Yeah, so uh, I just shared a different screen. So this is our web-based real-time screen. And you can see that, um, you know, what I'm doing is um, I'm associating the data that we're pulling from the equipment to relevant information. And it really starts with whether it's ERP or, like I said, Excel documents. But what we want to do is we want to be able to uh, bring data into the advanced MES system that says, Here's our SKU masters, and here's our tooling resource, labor, here's our machines. And what we're doing is we give you, within advanced MES, we give you the ability to then create jobs, and then we can associate, here's this job, labor, tooling, these resources to this job. So when we then start this work order, we have visualization as I mentioned, we're pinging this machine every second of the day, and we're saying, hey, what's the current status? So now we can provide these real-time visual dashboards. So this is one. We're in a web browser. I am actually looking at data that is relevant to me as an individual. So, you know, my role within a company might be VP of operations. It's going to be completely different information that I want to see if I'm a process engineer or a material handler or quality. And in this screen, it allows me to see various metrics. In our database, we have over 600 unique fields that we can choose from that says, give me data based upon what's actually happening on my floor to help me do my job better. So in this example, we've got various departments and I've defined what I want reflected for me as a user. 
So, for example, when when a machine goes into a down state, I can define what color that goes. So, in my demo scenario, any machine that's in a yellow is down for a reason, and I can define what that reason is. If I'm running the standard, it's green. If it's red, it's running out of tolerance. If it's blue, it's the machine is sitting idle. But essentially, what we're doing is we're taking data and we're making it relevant to the piece of equipment that we're capturing data from. So you can see here, as this job uh, starts to uh, get, you know, it gets a signal from the machine says, I just made a part. Here's how that part was manufactured. We're displaying that data. So this is just one of the many modules that allows us to relate relevant data, whether it comes from ERP or other sources, uh, to what we're capturing off the machine. Okay, very interesting. So I'm going to have just one follow-up question. I don't know if you are going to be able to show anything there, but my question is going to be, so you are saying that this is the data coming from machine. So I don't know how that data is being entered in the machine, but typically all of these machines are going to have many different protocols. Uh, the hardware is going to be very different. So integration is going to be very different as well. So is it going to be a real-time integration? If it is going to be real-time integration, how much effort is going to be required in integrating uh, with each of the machine that they might have? Yeah, great question. So once again, the slide that we were showing you in the PowerPoint, you know, about 10, 15 minutes ago, yep. was that integration to the machine aspect. So some of our machines require a connectivity through an Ethernet port, and we're using what we call OPCUA. And as you alluded to, all these OEM manufacturers have different ways of, of controlling the machine. So there's what we call different PLCs or program logic, program logic controllers. Yep. And in these PLCs, we need a method in which we can extract that data. So whether that's an Allen Bradley, a Siemens, whether it's a standardized OEM piece of uh, a PLC that we can configure and communicate using MT Connect or OPCUA, what we've done is we work with a company called Kepware primarily that allows us to extract that data from the PLCs and present it in our softwares. And that data can be a variety of things. So, you know, if I was on a machine and I'm going to pick this molding machine down here, and the reason I selected this is now I can dive into the data a little bit deeper. So if I wanted to go in and I wanted to see how consistent my cycle times were on a particular work center, I could click on that actual cycle time, and each one of these are a time and date stamp of when that cycle actually produced. So if I hover over that, you can see that it gives me a time and date, not only to my cycle time, but you know through process analysis. So on a, an injection molding sh machine specifically, I might read various pressures, temperatures, and times. Well, the PLC provides that data. It allows us to pull that in, and then I have the ability to tie upper and lower thresholds to that. And as it falls out, like in this example of cycle time, it's going to visually show me. Now, as Andrew mentioned, we also have the ability to do audible alarms. So it's not uncommon you walk into a plant using uh, that's using our product. And if a machine goes down or if it goes outside of a cycle time lower spec limit, it might you know, send an email or text to a process engineer, or quite often it might audibly announce that over a, over a PA system out on the shop floor. So, you know, you'll be in the plant floor walking around and you'll hear machine 23 is down for maintenance or down for a process condition. Those are all being triggered based upon the data that we're pulling, you know, through an OPC connection in this case, or, as I mentioned, if it's older pieces of equipment, we have our own proprietary hardware that allows us to capture that data and then also present it. Okay, very interesting. Andrew, anything to add there? I just want to make sure that... <laughs> No, I think I think Jeff covered it. Yeah, so connecting connecting the machines, you know, pretty pretty straightforward. Um, uh, you know, the nice thing about a, a, a that software Kepware is it's got kind of all the drivers to all the machine manufacturers, right? So so if they're they've got an OPC package on that machine, then we can connect to it. Um, there is opportunities if we needed to to put another controller out there to be able to get a signal from it. 
uh, or as Jeff alluded to, using our old ha own, hard own hardware, and then we're just grabbing, uh, maybe we're going to wire, because really old machine out there, we're going to wire directly into that machine and you know, grab some kind of analog signal or digital signal that tells us that something happened in, in, in the case of those older pieces of equipment that people may have out there today. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much, Andrew. So, uh, Jeff, we have roughly, what, 25 minutes right now in the show, and I want to make sure that you are able to demo whatever you wanted to demo. Um, so you can take roughly, what, 10 minutes uh, if you have anything to show us. And then, obviously, in the later segment of the episode, we will be covering the release as well as the features that we can excite the listeners about. So whatever you want to show us uh, for next 10 minutes, please go ahead. Yeah, let me just walk you through a 10 minutes of what the software would look like in in a real world application. So we, we talked about this particular screen. This is real time visualization of what's happening on my floor now. So, you know, I've got roughly, you know, 25, 30 machines out on my shop floor. Uh, in this example, I've got some conversion machines, extrusion machines, molding machine, printing. I got some rotational molding and then I've got some Swiss uh, turning machine. So you can see I've got a variety of different type of equipment and what I need is visualization. So this kind of comes hand in hand with, hey, I also need something for my shop floor employee to engage with, whether that's an operator, quality, um, you know, um, it could be maintenance. But what we have is what's called uh, an HMI application that runs in a web browser. And most of our clients, I would say, deploy this using some type of a device such as a tablet. So imagine having a 12 inch tablet at your at your machine. And there it allows the user experience to do a variety of different things. Now we have the ability to personalize this so I can add different content. Uh, I can uh, you know, uh, eliminate different tiles over here to the right to kind of give the user experience things that they need as opposed to, you know, maybe they're not providing a unique serial number uh, on a part or, or on, a, on a box of material, and maybe they don't need that. Or maybe they're not printing labels because ERP is doing that. So within this application, we can, we can remove tiles. I can add different things. Uh, to kind of give you an example of what I'm referring to, a lot of times, you know, when a customer will, you know, identify a, a product as good or bad, you know, a lot of times that is automated, which means that it goes to a vision system. And my vision system uh, notices that a diameter is incorrect or it has some kind of contamination on it. And, and that way it automatically scraps it. So over here, as I'm producing product, my, my number is going to increase automatically. And then if I had a reject that ha happened automatically, well, it would go through this process where it would read it and it would say, hey, the reason for that is I noticed two parts actually were defective because of, you know, it had a scratch on it. And you'll notice that now I have scrap product that took away from my good product and, and provided that feedback. But in certain circumstances, you know, that is a that is a individual that is inspecting it. And right there, it gives them the means in which they can identify, hey, I had an issue. Now, some of our customers, you know, what they've wanted is I want all these different tiles to be a different scrap reason. And as soon as I hit the tile that identifies that as a scratch or it had another issue, it automatically enters in a reject of one. So just kind of gives you the idea of some personalization that we've done. But within here, you know, I can go in as an operator, it gives me the ability to log in and associate labor to this. It gives me the ability to then, you know, if the, if the machine has the logic that says, the reason I'm down is because on this CNC machine, I had this, this M code that gave me a, uh, a reason of why it's down in a period of time of, of why it was down, then we can read that logic. In other instances, when you're doing maintenance, for example, you know, it doesn't understand that. So we provide you with a link that allows you to go in and, you know, define, hey, this is the reason I'm down and then select it. I can add commentary to that reason as well if I wanted to. And then now we acknowledge that, hey, that 22 minutes of downtime 
was for this particular maintenance reason. But calling for assistance, packing product out, reporting, looking at process analysis on your machine, being able to uh, document, you know, dimensional data, all that user experience can be done right from here. Is there a question, Sam? No, I think I'm I'm good. Uh, Andrew, if you have anything to add? Yeah, yeah, maybe just to add. So, so what I think is really interesting is that that people, I think tend to want to do well, right? You know, we all want to succeed in, in things that we're doing. So one of the interesting factors is when you show the operator how they're performing, uh, then that tends to increase performance. So uh, I've got a great story where I have a, I've got a customer in the Toronto area who implemented MES. And uh, before they did that, they did a really good job in capturing their baseline, try understanding what the efficiency was just by entering things in the ERP solution alone, right? And they were kind of doing a manual entry process for it. Uh, this particular company, they made kind of custom muffler parts. So they made tailpipes and they had kind of a, a manual, a lot of manual steps where they did kind of perforation and then the operator would have to actually pick up the the, the piece of metal, put it in a perforating machine, it would perforate, right? But what was really cool is that what he found was when he initially put the MES solution in, his productivity went up 25%, right? Because people could, they, first off, I think there was a factor where, oh, 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 they're watching what I'm doing, right? I better pick up the pace. Yeah. But what, what they found is that kind of self-adjusted over time a little bit, right? But they're still seeing about a 15% increase in productivity just from showing the operator how they're performing and, and kind of what their baseline should be from a performance standpoint. So just by giving them kind of these visual things like this, I think uh, it's really helpful just for operators to understand their performance. They want to know how they're doing and and they can maybe even compete with uh, with their buddy who's working over on the other machine to see who has the best performance for the day. So there's some kind of neat uh, outcomes from uh, implementing an MES solution like that. And I'll add on to that. So that's part of what we do with this real-time visualization. So imagine a, a large, you know, 85-inch monitor on your shop floor that helps them understand where they are. Uh, sometimes competitiveness drives, you know, um, um, increased uh, efficiency and performance. But not only are we analyzing what's happening now, but then what we've done is now I need metrics that help me understand how I can improve. So now we have a complete BI application that allows us to take content and really analyze it based upon different types of metrics that I want to see. So for example here, maybe I want to focus on my downtime. So here is a dashboard specifically that says over a period of time. So you've been using advanced MES for the last five years. Now I have data that supports how the product performed in the past. So in this example here, we're focusing strictly on downtime. Now we could, you know, there's dashboards that look at things like overall equipment effectiveness, quality, scrap, performance and things of that nature. But within here, it allows me really to analyze uh, the data different way by downtime. So these are what we call widgets. So now I'm looking at downtime by department for occurrences, but I could choose, you know, and change this to say, I wanna look at this by down hours or I wanna look at it by cost. Uh, but as I navigate down, we're looking at my bottom five downtime reasons, my top reasons, uh, and we can analyze that by machine, by reason itself. But on any one of these that tell a story around downtime, it allows us to further analyze this. So I'm currently looking at the current month. If I want to go back and say that period of time, I want to change to what happened yesterday. So I have the ability to go in here and I could click on yesterday, for example, or what happened three months ago. So I can click on any one of these metrics and I could go over here and I could select how I want to analyze the data. So now maybe it's by machine. And instead of focusing on every time a machine goes down, I want to look at cost. So I have the ability to change different elements. I could add multiple elements to it. So not only cost, but I can look at things like down hours. Um, I can look at that a lot of different ways. But if I really want to analyze my data, I then can go in here 
And then I could look at that buy downtime code where I can find out what part I actually was manufacturing, what tool or job that consists of. Maybe from a labor perspective, I want to analyze that as well. So on any one of these, it allows us to drill into the data, find root cause analysis to it, and really get a better experience over what happened in the past historically. And I can break that down anyway. Now, the great thing about this is on any one of these dashboards, I can say, hey, I like the way this data presents itself. So I can go in here and I can chart this any way I want. I can also go in here and save this as another widget and associate it to this dashboard. So that's the power of a BI tool. And, you know, we provide that, but certainly other customers use Power BI uh, as opposed to a tool that we have. So it's, it's uh, it, you know, the data ex exists in our database, and then we just provide a means to getting to the data. And you can see here in our system, you know, we've got about 36 different types of dashboards out of the box that really help tell a story around performance, you know, um, IOT, uh, so I can get in things like mean time between failure, mean time to repair. Um, I can get into things like preventative maintenance, uh, production information, but we've got all these pre-built BI tools out of the box using this specific application. Okay, yeah, very, maybe. go ahead, Andrew. I was going to say, yeah, maybe just to stress that point, right? Because, you know, think about the MES solution is gathering the information, which is great. But, you know, we're gathering that information because we want to see how we're doing, but we also want to improve, right? So so Je Jeff gave a great example of downtime where maybe I put some kind of continuous improvement program in face beca place because I'm getting a lot of hours where the machine is down because maybe the reason is, is something – kind of stupid you know i'm waiting for material i'm losing a lot of a lot of time where that machine is sitting idle because the material handling team couldn't get material to that machine soon enough right so i want to now eliminate that i've now got that metric in place that shows me how much time i'm i'm losing as a result of that i can see what machine or machines are the the biggest culprits for that reason right and then can can act on it to to improve with the the overall goal to improve something like uh the overall equipment effectiveness which i think jeff's going to talk about here now okay amazing guys so i am going to touch on this question from the audience and i'm probably going to have very similar questions as well overall in terms of the boundaries of different systems when you look at in from the lenses of just one system things are a bit easier because, you know, everything is going to reside inside one system. But when it comes to boundaries of different departments, different systems, different perspectives, that's where the real challenge is. So here, uh, by the way, Guru is asking, follow um, Guru, uh, G-U-R-U-R-A-J-K-U-M-A-R is the middle name and S-H-E-T-T-Y is the last name. Follow him. Amazing guy. Uh, now, uh, he is saying... Is Apicor MES have capability to integrate with PLM systems for product definitions, for example, engineering BOM and manufacturing info like manufacturing BOM and BOP? Uh, now, my question here is going to be technically, it may be possible. You guys are probably going to say yes. Uh, you know, you can do whatever you want. Uh, but my question is going to be more from the process perspective as well as more from the best practice perspective. Now, let's say if you uh, integrate your PLM to your MES, you are bypassing ERP, meaning that whole financial interaction is bypassed. So ERP is not going to know what is happening between your PLM and MES overall from the interaction perspective. So now from your uh, recommendation perspective, when you design these things, obviously these companies probably need to have a PLM. They need to have a, an MES. They need to have an ERP. So overall, from the process boundary perspective of these systems, as well as of the handshake, what would be your recommendation? Yeah, I'll start, Jeff. You can you can jump in if I if I misspeak here. So yeah, I I, I would typically recommend that that integration happens to the ERP solution because it's it's got the bills of material, it's got the routing is kind of pre-configured, you know, in there, etc. Right. So absolutely, like from an Epicor standpoint, our own software has integration to PLM to to CAD systems, etc. Where 
um, we're doing even checking, right? So where you're checking the PLM CAD system, what what they've done in there versus what is in the ERP solution and kind of giving you the, the chance to look at what changes are actually going to happen as a result of a change, perhaps in a PLM system. And then that can get sent into to ERP. And then MES at that point's looking at that uh, information for what it's working with. Um, Jeff, I don't know if you have anything to add there. No, I, I would tend to agree with you there. Um, you know, the only thing I would add is is maybe from a uh, PLM perspective, you know, it, depending on what we're tying to, we might be able to provide some uh, real-time metrics associated to it. But a lot of times what we're doing is we're using those abdominal readings and things like that, and we're just passing it to ERP. Okay, very interesting. So the next question I'm going to cover, that is also going to be more from the handshake perspective. And I think, Andrew, you mentioned uh, the material availability. Now, material availability is actually coming from your ERP because that's where that's probably going to be source of truth for your inventory. MES might augment the inventory data, but overall ERP is probably going to be the source of truth. So all of the material availability, and I don't know, when you mentioned the demand, I don't know if that is also going to have your material, uh, you know, as part of the demand. And if it is going to have that, and if anything changes from the ERP perspective, because your material is changing on the real time basis, right? There might be allocations that might be happening. There might be, uh, you know, inventory that may be coming in. So obviously the state of the inventory is changing inside your ERP. So how does that get translated into your MES? Because that is also going to impact your scheduling, if uh, my understanding is right. Um, Jeff, Andrew, are you guys with me? Yeah, I'm with you. So uh, you're right. It does start with ERP. And usually ERP is the record holder of, of your material management application. But once again, you know, with an MES, we're kind of focused on the resource side itself. Um, so specifically what that refers to is let's take an injection molding machine, for example. So you've got certain resins that that need to be consumed to manufacture a product, whether that's virgin material, concentrate colors, things of that nature. If it was a CNC operation and I was manufacturing out a block of stainless steel, I would still need a bill of materials associated to it. So in our part master, that bill of material comes over. So essentially it's saying that as I produce this part, here's how much material I'm consuming. And I can then provide feedback into what we're actually consuming based upon what we produced. The other way we could enhance that is we've got uh, blenders and things like that where we've uh, integrated McGuire, Conair. Uh, it allows us to extract that material blend specifically and really get a very accurate accountability of material consumption. And once again, because we have the ability to integrate to these types of devices, then we can take that data and then we could back flush it in ERP. And with that, it helps us understanding what materials we consumed at any given point during the operation in that shift. So it's, it's sort of a way of enhancing uh, visibility and consumption based upon real-time connectivity. And there's definitely timing there, Sam, like you, you kind of hit on it, right? If I'm doing an engineering change in PLM and that then gets passed over to the ERP solution, that change, typically what happens is the, 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 the standard routing bill of material will get updated based on that change. The existing jobs that have already been, you know, I'm gonna say released, right? Yeah. Out there will still have the old routing old bomb you know, and less, less, you know, typically when that PLM happens, sometimes they, they'll be uh, alerted to the fact there's actually five jobs out there that could potentially be impacted by this change. But attached to the job, there's actually operations. Attached to the job, there's material. That might have changed based on the person doing the scheduling. So that change typically doesn't automatically flow to the job, right? You know, somebody's got to make a decision to change that job at that point in time. And then we, we'll see whatever, whatever comes from the job to... Uh, to, to the MES solution. Yeah, great points, guys. Uh, yep. One more question before we move on to, uh, and I don't know how much time you are going, going to need for the release as well as the features that you want to excite the listeners about. 
how much time do you guys need? Five minutes? Uh, eight minutes? How much? Probably five minutes, not five even minutes? probably. Yeah, yeah. We'll okay, just. So, I got a couple of three, three big ones we can talk about. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So maybe I have one minute right now. So my question is going to be overall from the plant perspective versus let's say if I had eight different facilities and I don't know if this view is going to be only of the plant or all of the plants are going to be part of that MES layer. Are they talking to each other or if they need to talk to each other from the plant perspective? Do they need to go to ERP and then only can they talk? So what is happening overall between your plant-to-plant communication and that whole plant layer from the MES perspective? So there's a couple of things that happen. So each facility would have visibility in each plant location. But uh, with advanced MES, we have customers that uh, are under the same name that might have 12, 15, 20 different plants. And what they have the ability to do is is kind of summarize performance at each location. So what that means specifically, I was showing you before, we have the ability to kind of understand performance in a BI tool. So you'll notice here, so now I've got two different plants in this example. So now I'm getting data from two plants. But if I had 20 plants, this this BI tool allows us to go in, analyze the data for each plant. But you can see here that this is a summary of what my OE is for these two plants. If I had five or if I had 15 or 20, this would compromise or, or take those 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 plants and say collectively, Here's my efficiency uh, for those five plants. Now, it allows me to drill into each one of these plants. So if I only want to focus on plant two, I'll go ahead and highlight plant two, for example, hit focus. And now my data here will consist of only that one plant and how it's performing. So there are a lot of different tools that allow us to, you know, analyze collectively how all of my plants are doing. And likewise, real-time screens, dashboards. I have visual tools that help me understand how that plant is com- performing compared to the other. Okay. Anything you want to add, Andrew? No, I think you did a great job. Yeah, so you can get a consolidated view of the entire enterprise in one view. You got it. Yep. Okay. Great, guys. Um, so now I think we have roughly what five uh, minutes, and I hope that answers your questions. Uh, question, Guru. And if you have any follow up questions, please uh, comment, and we would be more than happy to answer those. Uh, so now, Andrew, I don't know. I mean, if you're going to have your uh, mic drop moment right now of those three things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. So what are we working on? I We always get kind of asked that, right? So, so there's a lot of things we're working on. So, um, at Epicor, uh, we've got this kind of kinetic web framework to enhance screens that we're going to bring across to the advanced MES solution. So again, uh, enhance the user experience on the screens that we have out there uh, is kind of one that we get. People want a better better user, user experience, right? So making that user experience better is a big one that we've got uh, on the calendar out there. Um, the, the other things maybe the, the audience might not know is that Epicor made an acquisition in October of a uh, process control uh, kind of MES solution that um, is really geared towards assembly operations. So they do like guided digital operating instructions embedded into the into it with process control tied to it, hooking up to things like torque guns and you know uh, devices of that nature. So that's that's something we're looking at. Uh, you know how that that uh, the, those two uh, solutions could work together moving forward. Um, and then this cloud-wise, so uh, you know we we've got some people doing some things in cloud today, but we're looking at moving the a solution into Azure, right? So that we can take advantage of some of the Azure tool set that's out there. They've got some great, for example, machine learning, AI components uh, to the to the Azure tool set that we think would really enhance what we're doing on the advanced MES side. And then the last piece is maybe not as exciting, but it's kind of necessary as our own, uh, uh, what we call our machine interface unit, our connected factory machine interface unit, our you know, edge device in essence, we're, we're looking at uh, uh, creating something new there as well, enhancing that moving forward. So 
those are all exciting because there's always things around um, feature functionality, of course, that we're adding. But I tried to focus more on kind of big picture things when we talked to your Sam that I thought the, that your audience would be specifically interested in. Okay, great. Do you have anything to add? No, I'm good. Okay, perfect. Uh, so I'm going to have one follow-up question, and I think we have one comment from the audience as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think Guru is saying that will it allow to have customized configuration if needed for a specific plant? And I think yeah. you guys already covered that, I, I believe, right? Um, yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. So like what, what uh, Jeff had shown was kind of what, what was powerful about the BI stuff that we showed is that we've got the content packs out of the box. So, so you don't have to make your own, right? If you, if you start with a tool like Power BI, you can maybe get there, right? But you know we've got some great dashboards out of the box for people those can totally be uh, customized configured create your own dashboards go after your own sources of data doesn't have to be limited to the mes solution i want to get stuff from mes stuff from this other maybe i got some other external quality solution or something that i want to grab information from and consolidate it into a single view so yeah as okay. well as the hmi on the shop floor our yeah. real-time screens all those you know, depending on the data that you want to see, depending on, you know, the functionality you want your operator quality maintenance to experience on the floor, all those are personalizable. Okay, amazing. So I'm going to have one follow-up question on the roadmap. So when you said connected factory, uh, is that going to be a replacement for Capeware, the company that you had mentioned? Are you guys going to do similar things as they are doing? So where does that fit overall in the value chain? Connected factory roadmap that you mentioned, Andrew. Yeah, uh, yeah. kind of what I was really referring to there was we've got a, a piece of hardware that we call our connected factory machine interface unit is kind of the idea with that specifically. But yeah, like obviously we're, we're working on the connected factory story all the time. I think the whole idea of ERP and MES connecting is a big part of that. And I think advanced MES in general is a big part of any industry 4.0 project you guys might have out there. If you've got smart factory projects, connected factory projects, connecting to machines on the shop floor and not just machines on the shop floor that you're doing from a, a manufacturing standpoint they could be auxiliary equipment that you've got on the shop floor that you want to uh you know connect to so lots of lots of good things we can do there okay guys so we are close to our time now any closing comments by any chance uh from either of you no, I, I guess I hope the audience can see the power of uh, an MES solution. I think, again, it is critical to improving performance. I mean, let's face it, if you're a manufacturing facility, all the money, you know, it's on the shop floor. If you can improve how the shop floor is performing, then that'll, that in turn is going to improve your bottom line and make you happier customers because you're sending out better quality parts, et cetera, out there, which I think is the goal of everyone. All right, amazing guys. So that's it for today. If you joined for the first time, this was part of our quarterly update series. And this uh, week we brought Epicor. Um, So make sure you guys are going to be watching our channel on LinkedIn and YouTube for the future episodes. On that note, thank you so much everybody for tuning in this afternoon. Thanks everyone. Thanks.